Welcome to the Classical Ideas Podcast. This is Greg Soden. George Frizzell was born on December 10th, 1951, and passed away on May 14th, 2020, at the age of 68. If you were a longtime listener of this show, you will remember that George was my first ever guest on episode two of the show. George is single-handedly the reason this show has existed for the past three years. Without him, there is no Classical Ideas podcast, and there is really no me, Greg, your host, interested as deeply as I am in these topics. The loss of a man I hold in a fatherly mentor role is something I am still coming to terms with even more than two months after his passing. I meant to put out this episode of this show ages ago, but it just kept eluding me. The loss of this person in my life is immeasurable, even though he and I were only a part of each other's lives for just over six years. George was my local mentor in my own religious studies teaching back when I lived in Columbia, Missouri. He taught English and religious studies for around 40 years in Texas and Missouri. The class I taught is called Classical Ideas and World Religions, which is the namesake of this podcast. George founded Classical Ideas and taught it for decades before I even entered the teaching profession. His wisdom and guidance in shepherding me into this job of teaching about religion is invaluable. He set me down this path. I'm beyond grateful he helped me find a purpose in my life. Teachers like that come along only a few times across the course of a lifetime. In this special tribute episode to George, I wanted friends of George to have the chance to tell their own stories and memories of him in their own words. So in the following narrations, the people who knew George talk about some of their favorite times with him. George's spirit shines through in these personal stories. It's heart-wrenching to listen to because I loved him so much, but I'm deeply grateful to every contributor to this project. If participants introduce themselves or not was up to them, and I have altered nothing about their contributions. A few past podcast guests pop up as well, so you may recognize a few voices if you listened to the early episodes of the show. George, we love you. We miss you. These stories are for you. Om Prem Lakam Yajamahe Sukhandim Pushti Vardhanam These chants are the Mahamrityunjaya Mantra, a prayer to Lord Shiva for the liberation of the soul. It translates, We worship the three-eyed Lord Shiva, who is fragrant and who nourishes all. Like the fruit falls off from the bondage of the stem, may we be liberated from death and from mortality. We are Gopal and Ananta and have been friends with George for the past two decades. We came to know of George as the Hickman teacher of our daughters Arthi and Aditi. We got involved in his world religion class visiting the class to provide in-person insights about Hinduism and the value systems in Indian culture. We came to value his friendship as a very kind and gentle soul 
a person who was so interested to learn about different cultures and share that with his students and colleagues his passion for knowledge about different peoples religions and culture was transformative for the students whose lives he touched his passion extended beyond the classroom as he created educational sessions on a city wide level including for teachers in the school system aimed at improving understanding among diverse peoples we would occasionally bump into george at the city rec center some mornings and he always showed concern and care for his former students by inquiring about their lives and their work we will certainly miss his warmth and kindness om shanti 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 my name is leila gasman and i remember so vividly the first time i met mr frizell um i was nervous to about living up to the expectations of my brother and my mom because he knew both of them very well and really liked them but i soon realized i had nothing to worry about because he just loved and appreciated everybody he taught and everybody he knew through his work in the community so much um and i would say he was one of the teachers that impacted me most throughout high school even though i never actually had him in the classroom because the district forced him to retire before i could take classical ideas but that's just a testament to the type of person he was he cared so much that he was still at hickman almost every day he still did amnesty international and speak your mind forums and just i always saw him around school and he gave me so many amazing opportunities and had so many amazing conversations with me and i just feel so lucky to have known him my name is aditi velor i was one of george frizell's students in his classical ideas class at hickman in the late 2000s and continued to be in touch with him from time to time even after graduating I know I and many others feel his loss keenly. Mr. Frizell was such a vital educator and friend, and his impact reached beyond a tight circle of family and friends to his students, his fellow educators, and the broader Columbia community. Even as we share in our collective grief over his passing, I find it impossible to think and talk about Mr. Frizell without smiling. My memories of him are just that forceful and invocation of joy. Mr. Frizell was everything you wanted in a teacher and mentor. He was a deeply empathetic person who had an uncanny ability to make students of all backgrounds and skill levels feel welcome and at ease. He encouraged curiosity and critical thinking and invited us to grapple with often unfamiliar ways of seeing, thinking, and believing. He modeled a commitment to justice for teenagers only just beginning to find their voices. with all the warmth and humor that such a task requires. I feel lucky to have known him and also really fortunate to carry everything he taught me in the classroom or by example into my own life. My deepest condolences to Mr. Frizell's family and loved ones. He will be fondly remembered and sorely missed. Social studies education has been a foundational part of my life. I spent my entire childhood in the hallowed halls of Hickman High School. I met so many teachers in on those weekends roaming those halls, and one of them was George Frizell. While I was never the best student, I was always dedicated to clubs at Hickman High School, one of which was Amnesty International. I have many wonderful memories of events he helped craft, including Quiz Bowl. George Frizell taught social studies in a way that was always welcoming. You always left classical ideas and world religions thinking about your world, not just your daily life. Everyone has a story of how George changed their day. I personally remember the stories of he and Phil going to diners and how they attended the famed Perchy Creek Diner out by Midway, a frequent haunt of the groupies in days past. George's impact goes beyond Hickman, beyond Columbia, and beyond the United States, including so many visits with Champalumbo. I believe these visits helped define his global mindset.
George took my mind and opened it in a way only a few other educators have in my life. I spent many a night cramming for classical ideas, but it was really after he asked me one day what language was hardest to learn. My 15-year-old self said Spanish, thinking it because I took it, and it was so hard that it must be the hardest language to learn. He broke a hard truth to me that day. I was dead wrong. From then on, I had a vigor in that classroom that I would bring to very few other classes in my academic career. And to make matters worse, Spanish was actually the easiest, see. From then on, I was always ready for classical ideas to challenge my ideas about the world. I can only hope that by all coming together and sharing our most memorable stories about George Frizzell, that we remember the impact he made on the world and on each other. I hope that we all take his lessons and invest our time in the betterment of others. As we face crisis after crisis in the world, now more than ever, we must remember that it is important to stand against injustice in the world, just like George taught us. George Frizzell. There has never been another guy like him. I could talk about George's unparalleled impact on his friends, colleagues, thousands of young people, his contributions to our town, his love of his Susie and family, or his quiet voice of steadfast strength. I could talk about all the times he dipped his hand into my bag of pretzels or carrots at lunch, or that one time he asked me for a bit of my store-bought fruit smoothie by wordlessly waving a mug at me. There were lots of sly jokes that bordered on inappropriate, and a couple of appearances at my annual tacky sweater party to which he wore one of his everyday sweaters, beige, with a Christmas stocking affixed by just four safety pins. One of my favorite books is Fates and Furies by Lauren Groff. One line from that book sticks with me more than any other. Because it's true, more than the highlights, the bright events, it was in the small and the daily where she'd found life. So I give you a small and daily from my time working with George at Hickman High School. At the beginning of my career, I like to arrive to work early in the morning. The building opened at 6, and my favorite time to inhabit my classroom was before the hallway lights were turned on and before the adolescent hustle and bustle of the day began. No matter what I did, George always beat me to the building, and his lights were always on when I arrived, whether it be right after 6 or closer to our 7.20 contracted start time. Sometime during my second year of teaching, I saw the movie The Painted Veil, starring Naomi Watts and Edward Norton. The movie had little impact on me, but I found the recurring piano music throughout the film beautiful and haunting. I did not know the name of the music and hadn't thought to look it up, even though it was absolutely stuck in my head. I later learned it was called Nocien One by the composer Eric Satie. A few weeks after viewing that film, I walked up the stairs to the English wing, turned the corner, saw George's classroom light spilling into the hallway. His classroom was across the hall from mine, and heard, blasting, the gorgeous yet eerie piano music I had been humming for weeks. Of course, I stopped to say hello and marvel at the coincidence before entering my classroom. I don't remember much of our conversation other than that it wasn't long and that George had not yet seen the painted veil. We both had to be ready for our first batch of teenagers and time was counting down so we went our separate ways quickly. The day passed without another mention of our musical serendipity, but the next morning I found on my desk a burned copy of Nocien One composed by Eric Satie, complete with customized CD label a la George sitting on my desk. To know George is to know his generosity, both in the big and sweeping, but also in the small and daily. Also, his love of flash drives and CD label making. Cheers to you, George. Hi, my name is Jessie Starbuck, 
and George Fursell was my teacher at Hickman High School from 1995 to 1996, and I was lucky enough to take his classical ideas and world religions course, uh, which I loved so much when I was in high school, and I got so much out of that experience. It had a profound impact on my life, but I'm recording today... um, I want to tell a story um, about George that I think perfectly sums up the kind of person he was and uh, and the reason that he's going to be so missed by so many of us. So when I was a senior in high school, there was one day that I was coming to school and I was running late. And I had this moment where I was sitting at the stoplight um, and I could go left and I could go to school and get another tardy or I could go straight (laughs) and I could skip a couple hours hours of school and and, uh, miss out on another tardy. So I chose on that particular day to go straight. And um, as a senior in high school, I was an art kid and I was kind of broody. So I ended up on um, going to the cemetery that's uh, right downtown. And I just sat in my car and I did homework for two hours and just caught up a little bit and and came back to school around third hour. Um, And then later on that day, I happened to pass George in the hallway and um, I had missed his class that that morning. He, he was my second hour class. And so I passed him in the hall and he said, Hey, are you okay? I, I missed you this morning. And, um, I was honest with him. I said, uh, you know, I, I ended up going to the cemetery to do a little bit of homework and, uh, I just caught up a little bit and, you know, I'm really sorry, I missed your class. And, and he said, Hey, have you ever been to that cemetery on Bethel Road? It is like one of the oldest ones in Columbia, and those gravestones are so interesting if you go and you read them and you look at them. And that moment of compassion that he showed for me as a senior, um, I was overwhelmed and I was exhausted and I was scared about my future. And the fact that he chose to connect with me instead of getting angry with me is just a perfect summary of the kind of person that he was. I met George in 1992, my senior year of college, as I was doing my student teaching at Hickman High School. I could never remember his name, just that he was the quirky guy in the English department with weird fashion sense and a tendency to be a close talker. A few years later, I returned to Hickman in a room across the hall from George. For those 14 years, George was one of the most important role models and friends I could ever have. There are a few people I've met whose mere presence set me at ease and filled me with joy. Most of them were Franciscan and Tibetan monks, but George was one of those rare people. I think we all just felt stronger, better, more joyful, more capable, and more hopeful in his presence. I loved having him visit my class to explain Hinduism to my sophomores in world history. He would speak of the Atman being like a cup of water, spending life after life trying to return to the Brahmin or a giant bowl of water. He would hold a glass in front of students and pour it back in a bowl with all the drama and suspense of a David Copperfield show in Vegas. And the students were entranced. He demonstrated the permanence of the water by pouring it on the floor. Same water, different container, right? He would leave the puddle. He made his point. Students found him odd too, but loved him. He was the guy who would notice your delicious lunch, reach across the table with his fork for a bite, and when his fork was in your food, he would then ask if you could try it. He would carry himself with a zen-like, calm, hopelessly polite demeanor, but quietly, only when he had your trust. He would crack some of the most outrageous and inappropriate jokes and then deny that he ever said such a thing. We shared more than a few beers over the years, mostly talking about school, but also sports and life in general. During a spiritual struggle, I asked George how he balanced his obvious non-material, very Zen-influenced outlook with the realities of life in a world that celebrates achievement, celebrity, and wealth. His honest discussion of his journey and his struggles was incredibly reassuring. We meditated together a few times and it was transformative for me. George, thank you for being on my Mount Rushmore of teachers. Thank you for living the power of a simple, warm and authentic greeting to all before starting a class or a meeting. Thank you for your spiritual guidance. Thank you for being a non-judgmental friend when I needed it most. 
Thank you for showing many of us what's possible. You'll be missed, but you will also live on in the hearts of all of your colleagues, your thousands of students who absolutely adored you. Thank you for being you and making us all better for it. Hi, Greg. Uh, as you know, I have several stories about George Frizzell uh, that I could tell you, but uh, one that would be perfect for your podcast involves uh, his activities with the uh, Hickman High School chapter of Amnesty International. Now, what George religiously did was he, with any club that he sponsored, was he expected students to create the agenda and make all the choices, which is absolutely the right way to approach any club if you're a sponsor. Uh, and some can't make that work, but, but George was really inspiring to his students. And what one activity they did every month was that the students would pick um, a prisoner of conscience uh, somewhere in the world. And uh, then for the meeting, George would gather the students and he'd have a little teaching together about that particular case then, uh, and he'd bring in treats and stuff. They would write letters to the powers that be that were controlling the imprisonment of that particular person. Um, and so w one month, uh, the students chose uh, Pussy Riot. And I know you're familiar with Pussy Riot. Uh, uh, fans of the podcast might not be, but they uh, are a political activist group in Russia very necessary political activist group in, in Russia that do uh, very amazing political protests, creative and angry and powerful and clear, but they also uh, do music as well. And it was no surprise that this particular year, these particular students would want to free, uh, I believe at that time it was uh, one member of Pussy Riot was in prison uh, and I believe it was in Siberia, but you'll have to check me on that. So, George green-lighted that, of course, because he, he was fearless about green-lighting even the most, you know, risky uh, student choice or idea as long as it was intellectually justifiable, uh, morally justifiable, and that they would learn something from it. But George claimed uh, to be uncomfortable saying the first word of the group's name aloud in front of students. And this was a year where all of the amnesty students, if memory serves, were female. <laughs> so he came to me, uh, and I was not surprised, and asked me if I would guest lead the discussion because A, uh, he knows that I have a symp sympathy for punk rock and that I am probably, I think he thought, I would be more comfortable, and I certainly would. I just kind of, my mind is on the, the name of the group. I'm not thinking of the anatomical part. So I agreed to do it. Uh, the, stu the students came to my classroom for the meeting. We had a great time. We, we watched a couple of pieces of video footage of their, their most famous uh, moment of activism, and we listened uh, at that time their first musical recordings had come out and we listened to a couple of those and we had treats and it was really fun. Uh, I'll always remember it. And I think I even wrote a, not that I wouldn't write a letter, but I was, it was exciting to sit down and pen a letter right there on the spot. So, um, the story kind of extends past this though. Um, I'd kind of forgotten about it and George, I think went on some trip and George always, Anytime we went on a trip, would buy gifts for probably multiple friends of his. I picture him coming back from a trip with a bag of things that he bought for people. And he brought, he showed up at my classroom door, I, re I remember, and brought me a very cool black Pussy Riot t-shirt with a, uh, a yellow fist in a circle. And then uh, across the top of the circle, it read, Free Pussy Riot. And a totally awesome shirt. It fit me. It was super comfortable. But it is a shirt <laughs> that uh, it's difficult for a professional to wear out in public without causing a distraction. I don't mind being associated with Pussy Riot, but if you're trying to educate and people are always looking at that, it, it just doesn't work. I also 
teach at a women's college and in some ways you'd think oh you'd be fine wearing it but believe me not exactly the most comfortable situation so anyway i was happy to get the shirt i wore i wear it around at home but i've only worn it out in public one time and here's where the story comes to an interesting conclusion um so george was retiring and the students and faculty wanted to throw him a surprise party in the hickman commons and it was really difficult george knows everybody and it's really difficult to surprise him or hide things from him but we were very able to do so we had the whole thing set up the local press was going to be there to take pictures write a story and uh, i remember uh it was after a school day and I was still I still was still dressed as I had been for school. I was about ready to leave and I thought, I am gonna wear that Pussy Riot t shirt in public to honor my friend. This is a perfect time to do it. And I, I was retiring the same year, so I was like, What are they gonna do? Fire me? So I put on a t shirt and I very often just wear kind of a dress shirt unbuttoned over t shirt, rock t shirts. It's kind of my uniform. So <laughs> so I went in that and George saw it and smiled. He was very surprised, by the way. I don't know how we kept it secret. And so they, uh, the Tri Columbia Tribune was there. They did a story. They snapped a bunch of pictures. And I can't remember exactly how this happened, uh, Greg. And I hope you'll believe me because I'm not lying. Uh, there may not be any proof. I think we may have seen uh, somehow multiple photographs that were taken that were not published because I did see the Tribune story just the other day when you sent me the link and like you can see me in the background but George's figure obscures the t-shirt but one of the photographs that was taken is of George receiving this award and I'm standing right next to him and my sh the, sh the dress shirt over the t-shirt is is partially obscuring the the uh, graphic design of the t-shirt and you can clearly read only the first two words of what I told you was the was the statement that was uh, running across the top of the the yellow fist in a circle and uh, I can I can prompt you remember what it said on it was free pussy riot so <laughs> I saw this picture I think maybe uh, uh, a reporter or the cameraman it was a digital photo and maybe he showed me some of them to ask me what I thought of them. I could have sworn it, it was in the paper but uh, George also saw it and I think he and I, the, I don't think the photographer even noticed it they were looking he was looking at George and George and I saw it and turned to each other and laughed so <laughs> to bring it to a conclusion uh, I, I have come to suspect that George would have been plenty comfortable saying Pussy Riot in front of the Amnesty International kids. I think he lured me into a position uh, so that he could be amused and I could be uncomfortable. It's very possible. He uh, was a master strategist. He was always thinking two or three steps ahead of, of most people. Uh, and uh, I'll always treasure that memory. So, I, you know, if you need another one, Greg, I got a million of them, but that's one of my favorites. Thanks for uh, inviting me to participate. My name is Michaela Frizzell. George was my uncle, my dad's younger brother. Growing up, I spent most of my time with George when he would come visit us in New York um, or when our families would get together in Beaumont. But in 2013, he came with my parents and visited me in Austin, Texas. And during that trip, we drove out to barbecue in Lockhart, Texas. And somehow on the drive home, George launched into a Richard Pryor routine that was ridiculous and hilarious. He knew every single word and retold it in this funny voice. Um, and as is a family trait, he could barely complete the routine because he was cracking himself and everyone else up so much. What I remember and will miss most about George is the peace and acceptance that came from being with him. George accepted you for who you are. He had opinions and values, but didn't judge other people. And I'll miss that greatly. I'm sending all his friends and family a lot of love from Texas. This is Eli Byerly Duke um, recording a 
Um, goodbye message I, I posted on Facebook May 16th uh, about George Frizzell. It's tough to be apart in hard times. George Frizzell's death makes it even more difficult. As a 16-year-old, he brought my politics out of Missouri and into the world. Nobody has better helped me relate to my own country's belligerence abroad. Along with his good friend, Phil Overy, he's my intellectual influence with the finest sense of the public. He was born in Texas, but I come from his Missouri. His work does not stop with his death. He taught philosophy and religion to public high school students, all comers desired. Everyone was at the table in a way that no college course could even attempt. He never needed to lay out the centrality of diversity of people and thought to his course more than once. It was plain to see, implicit in the lectures, guests, and the students he attracted to his course. His guest lecturers came from almost every faith he taught, so he never needed to be loud. Here they are. Listen to what they think. We asked the guests about gay people, speaking in tongues, heaven, and how good the chicken was at the potluck. I'll always remember him sitting in his back corner with a sly smile while a student talked through how many questions one of his guests had not answered. He took us seriously, so we took him seriously too, even those who didn't care much for the degree his course counted for. I'm grateful he never let the neurotic advanced placement crowd go on too long, just what we needed, and mostly wanted us to shut up and think. We looked better for it, then and since. He was a treasured part of my Missouri community, and it hurts to know that I won't have another lunch with him. Everyone contains multitudes, but seriously, this guy had it all. A serious intellectual, a wicked funny storyteller, a gambler, and a loving husband and friend. He will be missed by so many. My name is Rose Metro, and I met George Frizzell through Show Me Dharma, a Buddhist sangha here in Columbia, Missouri. He's been involved in that group for decades. I moved to Columbia about 10 years ago and began teaching meditation at Show Me Dharma in 2015. Not only would George come to meditate at Show Me Dharma, but he would also bring his students there to introduce them to what Buddhist practice looked like here in the U.S. He invited those of us teaching at Show Me Dharma to offer professional development to local school teachers. And in return, he gave us those famous World Religions t-shirts. In short, he acted as a bridge so that the wisdom of the Buddha's teachings were accessible to all. I immediately recognized the kind of person George was and the role he was taking in his students' lives, because I had also been a high school social studies teacher, and I had been inspired to go into that profession by teachers much like him. It wasn't just what he taught, it was how. He was humane. He listened to his students. He wasn't just doing a job. He cared. There's a quote from Parker Palmer, we teach who we are. That's what makes it so scary to be a teacher, but also so beautiful. Since George's death, I've seen several friends post on Facebook that George was the one who introduced them to meditation. I've also seen teacher friends say that he inspired them to become teachers. One person said, he showed me the kind of adult I wanted to become. When I think about how many people's lives he touched, I'm so inspired, both as a Buddhist and as an educator. In Buddhism, there's the idea of karma. Any action done skillfully and with good intention ripples outward to benefit all beings. This law of cause and effect can be seen within one's lifetime, but it is not confined to that lifetime. All the people George influenced will in turn influence others in positive ways. His open mind and big heart were a shining light in our community, and we will miss him so much. I took Frizzell's classical ideas in 2007, my junior year of high school. That's a developmental stage when most of my learning was still coming from textbooks, so it felt like a revelation to have a class that pointed us so much toward primary sources and direct experience. Rather than reading a chapter in a textbook, we read sacred texts for ourselves. We asked questions of our guest speakers who were actual believers and practitioners of the faiths we were learning about. 
We investigated and debated and reflected on our own beliefs. I remember sometimes running into George Frizzell at my Unitarian Universalist church on Sundays, though it was clear that, like many UUs, his faith was expansive and transcendent beyond any one label. He had faith in humanity, in the sweetness of life, in the interconnectedness of things. During my senior year at Hickman, I had an independent study with Frizzell and got my first glimpse of what a joy academic research could be. He was a supportive and enthusiastic mentor, guiding my curiosity with kindness and intellectual rigor as I read the Rig Veda for the first time and reached for deeper understanding. In 2013, I got my degree in religious studies from Grinnell College, and in 2014, I started down the long path toward ordination as a Unitarian Universalist minister. Both decisions are in no small part thanks to George Frizzell. Now, after years of studying, a master's degree from Harvard Divinity School, 400 hours of hospital chaplaincy training, and two years serving as a ministerial intern in a New England parish, I will be officially ordained as a UU minister on June 20th, 2020. The ceremony will be virtual, held over YouTube, open to friends and family across the world. And George Frizzell should have been there. My journey is marked in so many ways by his influence. I'm grateful beyond words for his life, for who he was. And I know that his impact will continue to ripple out beyond what anyone can see. Hi, this is Arthi Valor, uh, Hickman class of 2005. I want to begin by saying how devastating it is to hear of George Frizzell's passing. Uh, he was a uniquely kind, curious, and generous person, and it's a terrible loss not just to those of us who were fortunate to know him, but to the entire Mid-Missouri community as well. My sincerest condolences to his family and friends. I had the privilege of meeting George when I was a student in his Classical Ideas class at Hickman in the early 2000s. Uh, I remember it being one of the most popular classes in a school full of talented and passionate educators, the sort of class you heard about through word of mouth. Even at the time, but especially in retrospect, it's, it's hard to believe that anyone could get so many teenagers not only interested in, but really meaningfully engaged with such heady and at times provocative concepts. Uh, in a public high school, in rural Missouri, no less. As someone growing up out of the mainstream in mid-Missouri, a person of color, a child of immigrants, a non-Christian, I was grateful to George for helping to make this a more inclusive and welcoming environment, not just for me, but for everyone. Uh, I honestly believe that in exposing hundreds of students to new cultures and new ways of thinking over the years, uh, in helping us think critically, but also with sensitivity and respect, this class helped create a more thoughtful, compassionate, and open-minded climate at school, and as each successive cohort moved on into the adult world, beyond as well. I later knew George as an enthusiastic club sponsor, a co-convener of the Quiz Bowl, a facilitator of interfaith learning even outside of the school environment. Really, he added so much to life at Hickman and the wider community. I hope he was able to really see uh, during his lifetime the profound and positive impact that he had on people. As an educator myself now, it's something I can only aspire to. He will be missed. So uh, this is Phil and Nicole Overeem. We both knew George for about 30 years. We both taught with him at Hickman High School. We got to know him very well on a personal level and it was impossible not to get to know him well on an academic level. He was justifiably legendary, but he 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 was not perfect. And uh, this this particular story that Nicole and I both experienced will illustrate that. So uh, one weekend, uh, George invited Nicole and I to ride with him to Kansas City to to the temple of Champa Lumpo, who was a uh, Tibetan monk who lived in Kansas City. And he uh, George brought him to Hickman every year to speak to his classical ideas classes and also to world history classes. I had met Champa uh, when he was preparing for a talk in George's office a couple of times. Nicole had heard him speak numerous times 
uh, and, and I think knew him a lot better. So we both jumped at the chance to go to Champa's temple. Uh, we were very excited about it. And then we came back to earth when we realized that George would be driving. Uh, now, even casual friends of George know that he is a person that really should never be behind the wheel. And I associate that with his, the way his mental path is, that he's always kind of abstractly thinking about things that are really important. And sometimes the road is not important. Uh, but he had asked us to go. So we didn't feel comfortable, which we later would feel comfortable doing this, but we did not feel comfortable telling him, hey, we'll drive. We, we decided to, he came and picked us up on a Sunday morning and we took off. Right. Um, and I've got, I'm actually looking at a picture of uh, the Rime uh, Buddha or Buddhist Center and um seeing when what date that was exactly how long ago and it was actually almost two years ago on june 24th 2018 wow and so yeah it seems like a long time ago and not that long time ago um but i don't recall ever being too worried about being in the car with george and i know we've gone a few places with uh either Susie or George driving. And then, of course, one of my very first memories is of, jo of George is uh, him driving us out to Cape and Park after uh, the first dinner we all uh, sat down together. And I think that was in... Uh, 90 or 91. 91, definitely yeah. 91. Because I, we I was already living up here, so... Well, I don't think... That there were a couple of times where George and I rode together for whatever. One time it was when we were staying with your moms, and he gave me a ride back over to our house or something, and it was just a short ride on I-70, and it was filled with <laughs> terror. So we're on the way up to Kansas City, and George is, uh, was a great conversationalist, and he was very focused in conversation. You know, He was not one for small talk. He had a really great sense of humor, but... Uh, on, on just on the way up, we were so excited about the temple. I think we were not paying all that much attention to the driving, but even then, this is like you know, I 70s a four lane. He would drift across into the uh, passing lane without signaling or even really checking his mirrors. We'd be talking, and suddenly you'd hear gravel spitting up as he kind of headed gravel or whatever those little uh indentations yeah, are in the, the road warnings. to to kind of shake your car and wake you up. And I think we probably crossed over those maybe three or four times. And that was on the way up. And that was on the way up. And I do recall that there was something he was trying to solve with Susie yes. related to one of the kids possibly. Um, and I know Phil and I exchanged looks because he was again in the passenger seat and I was uh, directly behind George in the... Uh, uh, back back seat, so we could I could look at Phil or he could look at me as he was kind of turned facing talking to George, and there were a few times where we'd hear that the rattle of the car and the bump 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 of being in that like median area where you're not supposed to really be where you're trying you know they're waking up drivers, trying to say you know you're in a danger zone, and it was nothing to George. He just kind of, he scooted the car over, corrected it, and then, you know, we'd drive for another 20 or 30 minutes, and then you'd hear it again just for a split second, and I think he had his phone out yes. as well. Yeah. Jo um, George, if you knew him, would not have been the one you would suspect would be having a cell phone out while driving, but or even having a cell phone out, period, because... He was trying to help, though. Yes, it, was, it, it, it was all about... Yeah, that was the whole thing. Fulfilling his obligation as a father and a husband and, and trying to help take care of business. Um, and he was not a smooth self... He was not a smooth <laughs> smartphone handler, even when he was walking. So, as Nicole was pointing out, I would check his face, his face when we'd hit either the shoulder or go toward the median, and it was just placid. He did not seem to even recognize that there there were some 
there were some irregularities in his piloting of the vehicle. And I think Nicole alluded to this as well. He was kind of struggling to figure out this problem with Su- with that Susie he was trying to help Susie solve. It was something solve. family related that, yeah. And I, by the time we actually got to the temple, I think we were both on. Just we were about, awake. We were very awake, <laughs> and we were very thankful yeah. uh, to have arrived at the temple. But so, I was I was really excited about yeah, being we there. Quickly so I forgot just about like, that. Okay, you know we're here, and I honestly, I mean, I don't. Uh, know if I believe in divine uh, providence or not, but I don't <laughs> think that George would have killed us in a car accident or even maimed us or injured us. I think he had enough control, but it, you know, at the time it seemed a little wild uh, ride. Well, so. I think George felt that there was no way that divine <laughs> providence would interfere <laughs> with us, with getting, our, to us the, getting to the temple and back. Yeah. It was a divine journey, and maybe that's why he didn't care that he was driving very erratically. So we we, we experienced a service at the temple, which was fantastic. Mm-hmm. Uh, Other than the, the sitting on the floor and, and getting my legs adjusted to... Uh, George and Champa didn't seem to have any issues, and normally when we do meditation, it's sitting in a chair... Um, up, you know, upright, but uh, those seem to be far and uh, few and far between at the temple. So we chose to follow their lead and get uh, into a um, whatever the the cross leg position is, and then sit through temple. But then we saw I realized other people would occasionally move their legs and kind of uh, stretch out the Charlie horses and. Mm-hmm wake their legs up a little bit so it was no big deal and i'm glad we did that and i have the flexibility of a two by four so i was ex- <laughs> in extreme excruciating pain throughout it but it was really a great experience uh, we both hit the books there's a bookstore uh-huh. kind of a gift shop of sorts in the temple and we got we both bought books uh-huh. so then oh yeah we left out the whole thing we picked champa up Oh, and we got to see his house. Yeah, which is really cool. He's, he was and, having refurbished, or it was a, a house that had been lived in probably multiple generations. I'm guessing it was probably at least 60 years old. A smaller, very, very modest house, but um, I think maybe uh, one bedroom, one bath, or two bedroom, maybe one bath, but very modest, but he was doing... I think he was doing a lot of the uh, carpentry work mm-hmm. himself and maybe with the help of some friends. And he talked about his neighborhood. It was a really neat little neighborhood. It was. And it wasn't anything that we really expected. We had, were focused on the temple, but we got to see, you know, Champa lived and Champa was not in it. I don't, he wasn't in his robe at the time. Nope. So that was all neat. So after the service, we had decided that we would go out to eat together. So we went to... Was it a Thai restaurant? I believe it was a Thai restaurant. A Thai restaurant, da- kind of downtownish. In, in a commercial. In a com- it was on area, yeah, Kansas you know, City. I yeah. don't know if it was downtown, but. So, by the time we left the restaurant, we had a very good meal. By the time we we left the restaurant, a deluge had started. It was, mm-hmm. it was pouring sheets of rain, and I think probably Champa and George were thinking about they were not wanting to get wet. Nicole and I had already jumped ahead from the getting wet to George <laughs> driving in a torrential downpour. And you have to, here's one, if you've been to Kansas City, you will know this. You know, you come in, you're going west on I-70, and then you hit that, uh, it's the I-35 interchange, and it's a, it is a labyrinth, even if you've done it 50 or 60 times, there's a quick, there's two quick changes, and if you miss them, you're going in a complete different direction, and also people are going through it real quickly. And I don't think we'd even reached the car to get in before I was already visualizing George trying to negotiate that uh, on the way back. Um, because I was picturing how bad it is to do that when the weather's great. But And oh, by the way, I, I think I was also thinking about the ride back. I ordered a... I ordered a pint of beer at least one at the restaurant so that i would be somewhat anesthetized Chill. on the drive back so anyways just pouring sheets of rain we mm-hmm. dropped 
chomp off. I'm praying that it would just stop raining at least. No. Uh, George seemed to be piloting the vehicle even more calmly than he was on the way up, and the conditions were horrible, and he was not driving any more consistently. I think he slowed down. I feel like he slowed down. Um, yeah, Cause it, maybe. Because vi- visibility, <laughs> I remember getting out of Kansas City, was visibility seemed really bad. It was, it was, and I think the windshield wipers were on full. Uh, yeah. And it didn't matter. Yeah. It didn't matter. And so I'm sure many of you who are listening to this have seen Annie Hall. There's a scene where uh, Christopher Walken is playing Annie's brother, who has these suicidal impulses. And he's uh, Woody, he, he's driving, and Woody, is in the, Woody Allen's character is in the passenger seat, and... Uh, Walken starts talking about, and it's it's also it's raining in the scene, and he's talking about these impulses he has to just drive over on the other side of the road and kind of commit vehicular suicide. <laughs> and uh, aside from those, like George would never have had those inklings, but it was very reminiscent in every other way of that scene in uh, in Annie Hall, mm-hmm. and and the ride back was probably twice as er- erratic. Uh, I remember him driving for, instead of like veering over onto the shoulder momentarily, there was a, I think it was right when we were past Odessa, which is on the way, you're on the way back to Columbia. He actually drove with two wheels on the shoulder mm-hmm. for about a mile. <laughs> and um, I think it was after that, and this is something I would never normally ever do in particular i wouldn't have done it to george but i just said hey george and george oh by the way he's still fit he is still trying to solve this problem via cell phone uh i wish i knew what that was i wish i I knew what the problem was it's totally none of my business right now really or what but i remember he wasn't like secretly hiding anything about it i i remember him telling us and us thinking oh that does sound concerning but not while you're in the middle no, no, of please, driving yes. 75 miles per hour on a busy highway. But yeah. anyway, at so, one point, yeah, Phil no. did grab um, the phone and say, hey, let me help you with that, George. And and <laughs> let me text Susie or let me text Bess or whoever he was texting. Yeah, I um, said, yeah, why, why don't you... Yeah. Why don't you give me that phone and let I? It'd be much easier for me to do that. I would never have done that to anybody in reality. And George happily surrendered. Happily yeah. surrendered the phone. He wasn't. There and was I, I no ego in him at all. I about detected that. A, a slight mischievous smile <laughs> on his face as he was. He he knew that he was not the greatest driver in the world, but I think he was acknowledging that. And I left a key detail out too that. When we were taking Champa back through the torrential rain, speaking of little glimmers of acknowledgement of things, Champa, I swear to God, I saw Champa, I saw a glint of fear in Champa's eyes as we went through that interchange. And you know when a Tibetan monk is starting to show fear and be disconcerted, you, you have a reason to kind of think about your own mortality. But... Uh, so I got the phone from him and helped out with the conversation, and uh, we finally made it home. But I do believe <laughs> as soon as he dropped us off, I think we went straight to the liquor cabinet and poured <laughs> just a stiff drink. I probably drink. had a little drink, yeah. I, I think my, I took a nap, too, maybe. Yeah, we were drained of all energy. My yeah. stomach had done flip-flops. Way, other than the drive. And he had, through the whole thing, never had anything more than his typical placid smiling. Yeah. You know, he did not feel in danger at all during the entire time. So yeah. that's that. that it was one of the great... You know, I think he, even he would say it's those times that have a little danger that you really remember. You know, you're so filled full of fear. And then we had joy and fellowship and we learned all this stuff. And then the danger came back. It We were totally alive from the minute he picked us up to the minute he dropped us off. And I'm sure he probably saw it that way. But that's a little, that's a side of, little known side of George that, only people who've traveled with him have probably tasted. And we were lucky enough to um, 
get to spend a day yeah. with him and uh he without any complaint uh handed over the driving um well but there's a little thing inside of that too that and i can't remember nicole if you were with us but george and i at least george and i went to see a uh a lot it was a high def uh screening of a live shakespeare play at at, at the art theater here and there was a, a woman with her small child at this. And first of all, I think it was Macbeth, and I'm not sure that the child was age appropriate for that. But the kid was checking her cell phone. Development, well, we know. <laughs> through, through the entire first half of the play. And George, as soon as we hit intermission, went directly to the mother and said that if she didn't control that kid's phone, he was going to report her to the authorities at Ragtag. <laughs> so he was like, that's another thing about him. I think, you know, he understood that he was misusing his cell phone privileges. <laughs> and that's why he gave it to me. But it made me remember that he had no qualms about about doing that. No. But he was a many, many fat, he had many facets to him. And we were very lucky though to, yeah. to go up to, he really wanted to take us to Lulu's in uh, St. Louis. St. Louis. Yeah. And it uh, happened to be that the month of February uh, was a bit busy for us, but he'd been wanting to do it, and he knew Phil's birthday was coming up. And so he wanted to try to do it around Phil's birthday. And I think our first thought was, or at least mine was, who's driving? Right. Who's driving? Well, I told him. I said, yeah, we're totally down to do that, but we have to drive. <laughs> I just said without, that. I mean, without any fuss or uh, issue, he was like, oh, of course, no big deal. And and so I drove, and I consider myself a pretty, pretty safe driver and uh, got us there. We had a great day, and I'm so thankful for yeah, that. And our, I wish Our last trip at, to get the four of us together yeah. was like the last thing that we yeah. did before George passed. So I'm so grateful for that day, and we took lots of pictures. I remember having a good time and and uh, doing some exploration around the city and uh, just having a lot of laughs with those two. Yeah. And thanks, for uh, Greg, for giving us the, everybody the opportunity to tell these stories because it keeps him alive. Everybody who knew George Frizzell knew that he loved teaching and he loved his students. Uh, that's just baseline. But to get into how he really led a classroom, I'll tell one of his own stories. Um, being from mid-Missouri, there was a very strong Protestant evangelical community, and um, most people knew that whenever he taught his classical ideas and world religions course that the most famous part of it was Hinduism and Buddhism. But there was, of course, a very large Christianity section, too. And um, one, of, one young student said at the start of the unit, I bet I can get 100% on your test if you take it now, as he was raised with a strong faithful upbringing. And uh, Mr. Frizzell says, you know, I'll tell you what, if you get a... I think it was a 30% on this test, uh, I'll let you pass this unit. Student said, big deal, and he only cracked a 25. You know, shocked to find things like Manichaeism um, on the test or other aspects of pre-Christian faith. Like, Frizzell was all about context. He um, wouldn't just go over these things basic facts of religion, things that many of the students who took his class already knew, he wanted to convey to you in the strongest possible uh, forms why these religions were relevant, why they came to be. Um, and so aside from you know going into all of these backward contexts into contemporary Christianity, um, he, when he went into Hinduism, he uh, showed us like different cinematic adaptations of the Mahabharata and told us exactly why which ones were more global and which ones were more like nationalist almost to India and how, you know, what was meant to be taken literally, what was meant to be censored, how it reflected directorial stuff. I don't know. I could go on forever. But context was everything as to why he did it, you, why he taught. Um, you couldn't learn things without understanding why. And you'll always hear an English teacher say that, but from 
from a social studies perspective, it's pretty, uh, it's nice to hear it outside of warfare. And um, my own personal strongest connection to George was, uh, well, I founded the, the, the Quiz Bowl team at Hickman, not the intra-school competition, but the one that actually went around the state playing. And he wasn't our sponsor, but he was always its biggest fan. Um, he uh, was always asking me how you know it was going, how um, how our team would have to be split up for the uh, school competition to make things fair, and how he would um, always be our hype man. Um, for especially my senior year when we went to nationals, it was a. Uh, it was just rare to find someone with as pure and as caring of a heart as George. I sound sappy, but that that's him. Um, you know, we'll all miss him. We all still love him and always will, and I don't think anyone will forget him. It's, it's still hard to accept that he's passed. Um, it's like... It's like well, when I was going home to Columbia every now and again, I'd always get lunch with him. And I always, uh, you know, looked forward to his, like his chuckle and humble bows, like being right over on the horizon. But now it, now it's part of the horizon. It's nice to think he'll be looking over us anyways. Love you, George. So I'm here today with George Frizzell. Uh, George, welcome on the podcast. Hey, thank you. It's great to be here. So, uh, George, since you and I teach the same class, and you're the founder of the class, can you go ahead and start off by giving us a brief history of what classical ideas in in our school district is all about? Well, it actually began at Hickman High School in 1990. A group of students actually came to the principal, said they'd like to have a class that dealt with philosophy and religion. And I was quite lucky because I was in the English department, language arts, but there were no history takers. I'd had a double major in history and English, and my principal knew it. So I immediately volunteered to begin the class, and I was extremely excited about it. Fantastic. So what were the first uh, years like of teaching that class? There was a lot of trial and error, and as you know, we learn a lot from our students. So there would be certain books I would maybe try and then try to get some feedback from the students, and uh, they would have a good response to it or not. And then I immediately knew that I wanted the class to be about guest speakers. Uh, so, you know, when you've never had guest speaker before, you kind of have to put yourself out there and uh, you invite people. And some of them turned out to be great guest speakers and some of them we didn't invite back again. Uh, so that was really how we sort of began that format. We also wanted, because I was an English teacher, students were getting language arts credit for this class. Uh, I wanted to be sure that it included the primary sources of the great religions. And so that became immediately an integral part of the class. Fantastic. Uh, who were some of the, the best guest speakers that you had like early on? Like, how did you start diving into that? Like bringing people into the schools to talk about the religions that they practice? Well, really I would just sort of look at the different communities and try to contact those communities. And uh, either the leader of that community would be really in wanting to speak or they would give you a really you know, good recommendation of a person that would be articulate, would also be able to relate to the students. Uh, so, you know, really excellent guest speakers like Dr. Gopal and Anantha Gopal. Uh, we have uh, Tibetan monk Champa Lumpa, uh, the uh, in poet uh, Ray Ronsi, the Zen uh, master. Uh, we've had a lot of really great speakers. And really it's just uh, uh, inviting the speakers, but I think it's very important also uh, to make sure the speaker understands the parameters of the class and that no matter what, the, that they're not really there to proselytize in any way, but really just to, to educate. Wonderful. So this is a very sensitive subject, talking about religion in a school, because at any given time, there could be any students who practice those particular religions that are currently under study in the room with you. So can you talk about any, like, challenges you faced over the years of teaching about religion in Missouri? Well, you know, I've always said that Aristotle was uh, my savior because Aristotle has a quote, is the mark of an educated mind to consider an idea without accepting it. And that is the f how I begin the class, is to talk to the students and say, you know, we're going to be studying, you know, religions, and you might, you know, be a member of one of the religions that we study. So understand that we're not really here to 
judge the religion, uh, pass judgment on it, but we're here to be an educated mind. And so we're going to be able to consider ideas we would not necessarily accept. So, for example, in the Tibetan Hindu traditions where we have reincarnation and transmigration, I'm certainly not asking those students who don't come from those backgrounds to accept that cosmology, but they're not going to be able to understand Tibetan Buddhism or understand Hinduism unless they consider that as a possibility in terms of understanding the religion. Uh, and I think sometimes it can be a, a challenge if you have a student who, uh, and this is very rare, I think, but a student who feels like they have the, the single answer and they're not really interested in you know, listening to anyone else. But that's very rare. I think the class attracts individuals who, while they are very strong in their own religious traditions, are very open-minded to learn about others. Mm -hmm. How do you address certainty in the class? Like you mentioned that there might be somebody who's very, very certain that what they're doing is, is the way and it's the path that they're going to follow in their life. So have you ever had any challenges where you had to address um, certainty and how to show people how to question certainty? Well, uh, actually, in all honesty, uh, I don't really ask them to question certainty. So, for example, if I have an individual who happens to be uh, uh, a very fundamentalist Christian who very strongly feels that his particular cosmology is the only answer, or if you had an Islamic student or a Jewish student or a Hindu student who felt that their, their way was the only way, uh, the reality would be is that they live in a world with many cultures, many traditions, and in order to understand those other cultures and traditions, they really have to understand the, the cosmologies of those other groups. Not that it means to question their own you know, belief, mm -hmm. but to understand their culture. It's like, as Prothrero said. Those are some of the most amazing experiences. At the end of, la uh, at the end of one of the years I taught, I can't remember exactly which one it was, but there were two students who did not like each other at the beginning of the year because one of the students uh, considered themselves a hardcore atheist and the other student considered themselves a an evangelical Christian. And they would listen to each other say things across the room throughout the course of the year. And they just had this ingrained feeling like that person isn't really somebody that I'm that I'm attached to. And throughout the course of the year, they had these little conversations that brought them closer and closer together so that at the end of the year, that's what they were thinking about. And they were like they were building these new um, connections among each other. So it was a really amazing Thing to watch these students completely at odds over the course of the year realize that wow this has been so useful for getting us together and having us uh, having a safe space to talk about ideas so that's what i loved about it i think that is great you know when voltaire at least they attribute to voltaire though i disagree with what you say i would defend to the death you're right to say it mm -hmm. i think our students very much feel that way that while they won't necessarily agree with other classmates they really respect very strongly that individual's right to express his or her view. And I think that uh, the students, I think, very early in the course understand that uh, they're not necessarily there to, to be in a uh, you know, combative role with each other, but that they will, they will learn a lot from each other. At the end of the year, I took a picture of four young ladies. Uh, one was Jewish, one was Christian, one was Islamic, and one was Baha'i. And those four girls are all very, very close friends. And they all be very strongly in their own faith traditions. Fantastic. Um, so let's dive in and talk about some of your favorite things to, to talk about. Uh, what are your favorite religions to teach over the course of a year and why? Well, there, I have a real prejudice here because I know that my students probably in their survey classes, like their sophomore survey class, and in the culture in which they live, they're going to get a lot of Christianity and Judaism, and now in Columbia even, Islamic traditions. But my students, for the most part, know less about religions like Jainism and the importance of religion like Zoroastrianism and the significance of, say, the uh, African indigenous traditions. Uh, so I tend to like uh, the religions like that in Sikhism or Sikhism uh, because the students sometimes for the very first time will have been exposed to that. And I had a young man who went off to uh, uh, to Washington, D.C. to go to college. And he said that uh, when his roommate walked in the class, uh, walked into the room, his dorm room, he was a Sikh. 
and this student could recognize him as a Sikh from what we'd studied in class and our guest speakers. And this really helped him sort of adapt to the, uh, the modern world in that respect. And I bet that he immediately in that situation felt comfortable asking his Sikh roommate a question about anything. So they, I bet that they were much more able to bond as roommates. Yeah, exactly. And again, I always tell my students, you know, while certainly I, I hope that you will indeed have respect for other people's religions, be willing, if you're comfortable with it, sharing your own perspectives as well. Mm-hmm. Uh, because I don't want them to think that you know, the whole idea of studying religion is just to receive, but it's also to share. Wonderful. Um so what are some of your favorite experiences that you provide for young people every year? Like what are your favorite things that you look forward to in the class that you are, that you do with students? Well, one of my actual very favorite activities uh, is at the very beginning of the year, my students uh, take a sort of a, a symbol uh, test mm-hmm. just to see how much they know the symbols. And then it sort of gets them very interested in that. And then after they learn the symbols later, it sort of makes sense to them if they understand that, you know, humans are very uh, symbolic animals in that respect. The other activity I really love very early in the year is I have 10 great philosophical questions that they do a free writing on. And then the first time they're ever in groups is they're put into groups with students who have written on that very same philosophical question. And then uh, I make sure the groups are no smaller than three, but no larger than six. And then they get a chance to share how they addressed each of these philosophical questions. So the people writing on free will will get a sense that other people may take a very different perspective of free will. One person might take a very religious perspective, another person might take a very scientific perspective. And uh, then they kind of get to share that and to talk about that in class. And it's one of the very first experiences of the year, but it gets them thinking philosophically and religiously. What's so interesting, you keep bringing up free will, and that's just kind of a little, it's a little area of interest of mine as well. And so one of the arguments that I keep following is that between the philosophers Daniel Dennett and Sam Harris, where those two guys uh, are diametrically opposed on their disagreement of if, if free will even exists at all. So that's a really amazing conversation that I've been following back and forth the last couple of years about free will. Does it even exist? Do we have free will? Or are we just merely puppets of the universe? Yeah, it's an exciting question. And uh, again, uh, one of my uh, favorite quotes is the quote that we must believe in free will. We have no choice. That's fantastic. Um, so why does studying religion continue to interest you? I mean, you've been, you know, you started teaching the class in 1990 why do you still care? Why have you not burned out on this topic yet? I think it's probably because I know that every year I'm going to learn something new. And it may be from my students. It may be from a guest speaker. It may be from some reading that I haven't done before. And again, uh, the, the vastness of religious literature is so great that I know that you're really on top of really reading contemporary uh, interpretation analysis of what's going on in the world a lot of that times that has to do with religion but you're just going to continually to learn and so i mean if one of us began reading all of the hindu scriptures today you know we'd never read it in our entire lifetime and so i think that we continue to learn and again we also look at the dynamics of the world and we see how religion plays a role in that it becomes very exciting just the other day i was at a swimming pool and someone asked me about a religion which I had never heard of, of a particular denomination in Christianity. I thought it was quite interesting that, you know, here's a person that brings up a denomination that I've never heard of and I've been teaching for quite some time. And to regress to one of your earlier questions, when we study Christianity, one of the things I show my students is the yellow pages, actually from a few years ago, because as we know, because of, you know, cell phones, you're not going to have quite as many listings. Mm -hmm. But Every year when I look at uh, the yellow pages and see what religions are there, there are some religions that are no longer around and then other new religions that are there. It's also a great way to teach vocabulary because they see the names of each of these religious institutions is going to have a significant uh, symbolic uh, meaning for that particular religion. Mm -hmm. And if you grow up going to one particular church, I mean, you're not necessarily going to know all of your neighbors in a 10 mile radius, I mean, of all the different denominations. So the diversity within even one person's own 
single religion is, I mean, you could study that forever. Yeah. In, in Hickman High School, there are probably 10 churches within five blocks of the school. Mm -hmm. And that's pretty amazing. And uh, when students uh, look in the uh, yellow pages, they find that just within a 30-mile radius of Columbia, there are over 800 different religious institutions. So whenever we study denominations of Christianity, what's so funny is I give them this chart, and one of the things they have to research is, are infants baptized, or is it later in life baptism? So it's the credo, belief, or is it the child baptism? And they are absolutely amazed to see the differences between the denominations on that single characteristic. Um, and then they go inevitably home and they talk to their family about uh, like, oh, did you know that this group baptizes at babies and this group baptizes when they're older or if they've chosen to do so? And they love looking at even the distinctions within just Christianity that they practice and they are able to flourish and see so many new things about their own religion. That is amazing. One of the things I would like to do, I know you've done this before too, is to say to the students, you know, we had some interesting discussions today. Why don't you run that by what your parents think about that? And I think that that's another good way of keeping kind of goodwill, you know, with the community. Because mm -hmm. I've had many parents I've talked to who said, you know, you know, class is the only class where my student comes home and says, you know, we talked about this philosophical issue today. How, what do you think about it? And it's, it, it's good, uh, I think, for the families to discuss those issues. That happens to me all the time. And to be perfectly frank, that is one of the major reasons I'm even doing this podcast is so that I can tell all the parents, hey, subscribe to the podcast, listen, talk to your kids about it, and talk about what we're talking about in class. So it's complete transparency on what's going on in the room. Because, I mean, you put a class about teaching about religion into the hands of the wrong person yeah. and it could be quite detrimental it, it could be and in the past i've had conversations with individuals that find out i teach religion and they will make a comment like oh, gosh i wish i taught that class i could tell the students what they're supposed to believe and i you know i say you know if my students i know would uh even not stand for that mm -hmm. because they're not in the class to <laughs> be indoctrinated they're in the class really to explore culture philosophy religious thought it's fantastic. Uh, have any of your students that you know of ever like gone abroad after taking your class, had an experience related to the class, and then come back and told you about it? Yeah, uh, quite a few. Uh, you know, it's great because uh, you, there are a lot of opportunities for students to teach English in Asia. I've had quite a few students who have gone to either, say, Korea or China or Japan and taught there, and then they come back and talk a little bit about their experiences uh, religiously and experiences with uh, – having a better understanding of the culture, whether it's a Buddhist culture or Islamic culture. And so I think that, uh, I hope that studying religions also encourages students to, to travel and then to, to share their experiences. But I had students, for example, and again, this isn't going out of the country, but they'd studied the Baha'i faith and they wanted to uh, go over to Illinois and to see the Baha'i temple there. And then they usually get very excited about that. Nice. I showed a video of that Baha'i Temple of Rain Wilson, the actor from The Office, uh, yeah. talking about growing up there and going to the temple, um, and they find that to be so fascinating. So let's talk about some texts for a couple minutes. Um, what are some texts about religion? So say that you have a person out on the street, you run into somebody on the street, and you get into a random conversation, and, they're, and they find out what you do, and they're like, well, what should I read? If I want to know more, that's a great question. And over through a lot of trial and error, uh, I say, you know, if you're studying Hinduism, what I would recommend for you to read is the Bhagavad Gita. It's actually only about 80 or 90 pages inside a text that's almost 10,000 pages long, the Mahabharata. But in the uh, Bhagavad Gita, one can get most of the cosmology of Hinduism in a very interesting poetic and symbolic form. And in Buddhism, the Sermon of Benares, uh, the first Sermon of the Buddha where he outlines the Four Noble Truths and Eightfold Path. In the Western traditions, there are some, and coming from the English background, we talk about epitomizing, you know, texts and epitomizing passages. By beginning with Genesis, we will see Genesis as very, very important in the Jewish tradition, obviously. And again, it's a story about free will. As Christians, believe in the 
Jewish tradition as well, though we'll call it, they will call it the Old Testament, they see that it, Genesis begins to interpret it a little bit differently, where you have the idea of original sin. Mm-hmm. And again, very important, and we, you had talked about baptism, whether it's infant or as an adult, or a believer's baptism, that infant baptism comes from the interpretation, of course, of original sin. And then when we study Islam, the story of Genesis is retold in about 15 or 20 places in the Holy Quran, so they can sort of see the interpretation, understanding of Genesis there. So I think that uh, there we have some wonderful primary sources, and these are all pretty accessible and pretty easy. And then, of course, in the traditions of China, where we're looking at uh, Confucianism and Taoism, the Analects of Confucius and the Tao Te Ching are wonderful sources uh, for understanding Chinese philosophy. So some of my favorite translations of those, uh, my favorite translation, I think, of the Bhagavad Gita is by a scholar named Eknath Azwaran, uh-huh. and he's got the most unbelievable introduction chapter. It's about 50 pages long, it's, which is almost as long as the entire Bhagavad Gita translation, Right. but that is so good. But another one that I use a lot is the translation of Barbara Stoller Miller, which is the one I think that you use. It is, yes. And the audible audiobook performance by Jacob Needleman of Barbara Stoller Miller's Bhagavad Gita, the students love it because his voice is so deep and rich and epic and slow, and they love it. Um, and then as far as the Tao Te Ching goes, I love the one uh, by Stanley Lombardo and Stephen Addis uh, because of there is a collection of classical calligraphy paintings dispersed throughout the entire text that are thematically related to uh, whatever of the 81 teachings is currently being looked at. And they have a really awesome translation version where they'll include a line of the original Chinese in the text. And then at the back of the book, they have the translation guide for what all those characters mean. So essentially, by getting that uh, that um, Addison Lombardo version, you can become your own translator of the Tao Te Ching. So it's such a cool activity, uh, finding all the different versions that are out there. I loved it. And my class actually Skyped in with Stanley Lombardo last year about his translation of the Tao Te Ching, and we had an amazing conversation about that. So it's so cool. That sounds great. Mm-hmm. So... Um, one of the things I want to talk about, um, is why you think that non-practitioners should study all religions. Why is this an important issue in the world today? So, and why do you think that non-practitioners should spend their very, very, um, finite free time studying religions that they don't even practice? What's the point? Well, you know, uh, number one, as, as Stephen Prothero says, the only way to be really a citizen of the world, the only way to really be a well-educated individual is to understand these religious perspectives, not to necessarily agree with them, but to understand them. And when Pew put out a, uh, a survey, uh, I think two years ago, 20% of the individuals who responded to the survey identified themselves as spiritual but not religious. So it's clear that there are many people who are not necessarily going to practice in necessarily a formal way uh, by attending a church, a synagogue, a mosque, a temple, but they still believe that there can be some value in, say, some religious traditions and in spiritual traditions. So I think that there's more and more people, obviously more and more people in the United States, who are not necessarily practicing by attending or belonging formally to a church, but there's still a great deal of interest in the spirituality. So I think this concept of spiritual but not religious uh, is uh, one way of addressing why that's so important. There are a lot of people who don't want to become part of an institution necessarily who still want to explore a lot of these great philosophical and religious questions. Do you have any favorite uh, wisdom from any of these texts that really stand out to you from the religions that you don't personally practice? Yeah, I think that uh, one of the comparisons my students do is where they look at uh, Ecclesiastes uh, from the Jewish text, Jewish tradition, and then they look at another passage. I think it's one of the ones in the 40s of the uh, Tao Te Ching, where it just talks about how indeed, you know, there's a time and a place for everything. 
and uh, the fact that these are so distant and they certainly did not influence each other, but they, the wisdom literature of understanding the, the time and place is extremely important. I think it's so fascinating the way that something like the Tao Te Ching can make a person in 2017 feel connected to somebody from thousands of years ago and see that human beings, we don't have this all figured out. There, we still face similar struggles in our day-to-day -day lives, but also in our own heads, in our mental uh, doubts about ourselves and like where we're going and where we've been and where we hope to go. So I just think that that's such a neat aspect of reading texts from things that I don't practice. I agree. And you know, I always tell my students that the one thing they'll have to accept is that religious texts are not scientific texts. You're going to have some omission, you're going to have some paradox, and you're going to have some mystery. And that's part of uh, sort of the human experience is to come to terms with, you know, mystery and paradox and omission. And uh, I think that a lot of times people get in trouble when they want to, you know, interpret religious texts as scientific texts. So we're going to we're going to close up here in a okay. few minutes, but you're technically retired now, right? Correct. OK, yeah. So I know that you have many projects that you are currently working on, but my plan is to promote this podcast as much as I possibly can. So knowing that many of your former students and many of your former guest speakers are going to listen to this, do you have a message for them um, for participating in your class over the years? Well, I would really thank them you know, for you know, all, everything I've learned from them. And that includes both guest speakers and from students as well. So it's been a, a you know great journey to um, continue teaching in different ways. But uh, all the students I've had over the years have taught me an awful lot, and these guest speakers uh, have have done a great job. And I think that uh, when students look back at their you know high school careers and they think of well, you know what were some of the special memories, I know for me they were. You know these speakers who are willing to share sort of their time and uh, their traditions with us. I mean, many of them came to your class for 10, 12, 15 years. Exactly. Yeah, the our Tibetan monk Champalupa, I think, came for the first time in uh, the year two thousand. So he's he's been there for a long time. Every single year. Yeah. Well, fantastic. Um, George this has been a great conversation. Greg, thanks very much. As I said, you know, it's uh, it's been a pleasure, you know, learning from you. You know, just the few years that you've been teaching this, there are texts that you introduced me to and guest speakers that we've sort of explored and, you know, learned about together that have been really, really uh, helpful. And I, so, again, thank you for all that you've taught me. You're welcome. And uh, we'll continue working together. Most definitely. Thanks for coming on the Classical Ideas podcast, George Frizzell. Thank you so much for listening to this special episode of the Classical Ideas podcast dedicated to the memory of my friend and teacher and mentor, George Frizzell. As I'm sure you heard in all of those fantastic stories that people shared, George was so beloved by so many people, and I wish I could, ex uh, I wish I could examine and include so many more stories within the context of this show. And I'm so grateful to you for listening to this episode of the podcast. This was a very special one for me, a very unique one in the catalog um, of the work that I've been doing on this show for the last three years. Because without George, seriously, I mean, I would never, ever would have done a show like this. There's no way. So instead of rambling on about how important George was to me, um, I'm just going to leave it here because I think about him all the time and I know that the people who are whose voices are featured in this episode, they think about him all the time as well. And I'm just going to say it again. George, we love you. We miss you. Thank you for everything you ever did for us and all the ways that you helped us grow as people. I'll never forget you. 